our second set of debaters. We've got George Willis. We've got Haney Malamut. No, they're not just people who do password. They actually do know some medicine as well. And these two guys are going to talk about the role of epinephrine in cardiac arrest. What's up? What's up? So we're going to have a conversation between he and I on the use of epinephrine and out of hospital cardiac arrest. We don't have no slides today because we don't need slides. Where we're going, we don't need slides. <laughs> I'm wearing a cowboy hat today because looking at the literature, it shows a pretty good amount of mounting evidence that shows that epinephrine and out of, heart, out of hospital cardiac arrest doesn't really show a lot of way in the way of benefits. And so, as a result of that, my feeling is you must be a cowboy if you really want to use epinephrine and out-of-hospital cardiac arrest. So, let's start with a little bit of the literature. Go back to 2014. Looking back before 2014, there were a number of articles that came out looking at epinephrine versus placebo and the use of out-of-hospital cardiac arrest. Most of them randomized controlled trials, and they found, most of the time, that there wasn't really any improved survival. Also, there wasn't really any improved neurologic output. All that they saw was a little bit of increased return of spontaneous circulation and not really a whole lot else. Subsequently, in Resuscitation 2014, there was an article by Lynn et al., which looked at specifically those randomized controlled trials, found 14 of them that compared either epinephrine versus placebo, standard dose epinephrine versus high dose epinephrine, or standard dose epinephrine versus a combination of vasopressin and standard dose epinephrine. And with that, they found increased survival to admission, increased return of spontaneous circulation, but in terms of neuro outcomes and survival to discharge, no real significant difference between the two. So my personal feeling, there's really not a whole lot of need or use for epinephrine and out of hospital cardiac arrest. Okay, George, I'll take the using epinephrine and cardiac arrest, but before we do, this is our first debate that we've ever had. You're right, you're right. We should have a drink. We, we should have a drink. I just happen to pick up. Oh my gosh. Yeah, no. Yeah. It's, I even heard this was your favorite. Oh. Pineapple rum? Pineapple rum. That's how the gangsters roll. <laughs> have some glasses. Awesome. Yeah, come on, let's have a drink. Wow. Yeah. This is great. Yeah. I didn't know I was going to come to Rebellion and get drunk. Oh, yeah. <laughs> a little for you, a little more for me. <laughs> okay. All right. Here's to a great debate, George. Great debate. Nice, clean debate. Cheers. Okay. Mm. Oh, hang on. It's now smooth. Just, yeah. There you go, my friend. <sighs> just there you go. Perfect. Cheers. 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 Mm. Okay. Well, George, you know, let me just give you, let me give you a bigger oh, lesson. Oh, oh, oh. oh, come on, George. It's all right. It's, <laughs> I like this. This is really good. Mm -hmm. But I don't know if I like it that much. I mean, I don't want, this is too much. Oh, I see, I see. Well, thank you for proving my first point. And my first point is that epinephrine and cardiac arrest is good, maybe in moderation. Maybe we're using too much of the drug. So thanks for illustrating that point for me. I see what you did there. Yeah. <coughs> Here's the thing. One milligram every three to five minutes, that might certainly be a lot. But what you've already pointed out is that you get return of spontaneous circulation if you give epinephrine. You get people to the hospital, sometimes they even survive to discharge. Here's the thing, if you can get them to the hospital, they now have a chance to survive before they don't have a chance. You need to buy a lotto ticket to play the lotto. You need to be in it to win it. So if I can get them to the hospital, maybe I can even get them on VA ECMO. They have a chance. And the other thing, is that we can't discount all the other things that we're finding out about patients in the hospital. We know now that targeted temperature management is neuroprotective. That's something we didn't know before. We are finding out that there's a different MAP goal that we should be going for. No longer 65, we're aiming for higher MAP goals now. We're avoiding hyperoxia. We're careful about the ventilator that we're using. There's so much stuff that we are learning about neuroprotection. It's not just the epi, so I'm still gonna be using epi in cardiac arrest. Interesting. <laughs> I'm curious, did you bring me up here to get me drunk and maybe mess up during this whole thing? Is that what this was all about? I mean, why are you wearing a red suit? Oh, uh, this, uh, I was just going to play devil's advocate for whatever you said. Oh, I'll see how this is going to go. Okay. <clears throat> well, you bring up some interesting points. Temperature. Sorry. Didn't mean to distract you. Sorry about that. Sorry. 
See, he came to play hardball today. <laughs> so you bring up some very interesting points. You bring up targeted temperature management, ECMO, a lot of these advanced interventions. Let's talk about some of these advanced interventions. There's a study that came out by San Gavi et al. in 2015 that looks specifically at a lot of some of these advanced interventions, specifically in the out-of-hospital and pre-hospital systems. And what they found, <coughs> comparing observationally ALS units versus BLS units, 31,000 ALS units versus about 1,600 BLS units. They looked at a comparison of which ones did better. Subsequently, found that the ones who had all the advanced stuff, airway, shocks, CPR, IV therapy, including medications, including epinephrine, those patients actually had decreased survival, increased mortality, decreased neuro outcomes, decreased survival to hospital discharge. So I'm interested because it seems like all we really need to do in these circumstances to help improve mortality and survival and saving lives is just some good old chest compressions, maybe a little bit of airway, but not necessarily that advanced airway stuff that ALS really kind of implies and really it tries to, to import it to their patients. That's my thought. I see, I see that alcohol is now getting to the brain. Perfect timing. <laughs> Because what you fail to point out is that with ALS, there are advanced airways that are being placed. And we know plenty of studies that are now showing that placing advanced airways lead to worse outcomes in our patient. Now, now I don't deny that good old fashioned chest compressions get you better survival, number needed to treat a 15. Early defibrillation, number needed to treat a five. But again, to put all of this increased mortality just on epinephrine and not the potential for advanced airway, Maybe potentially ALS is staying longer on the scene and managing these patients versus BLS, which is scooping and running. Maybe that's the effect that we're seeing. But to just to blame it on epinephrine, that's not very nice. Hmm. Well, let's, let's go to the most recent stuff. We've got the Paramedic 2 trial, came out 2018, specifically looking at that exact question. Is epinephrine better for patients in out-of-hospital cardiac arrest? Great randomized controlled trial, 8,000 patients in the United Kingdom, and they actually implemented, again, saline, I'm sorry, epinephrine versus placebo. Now, it took a little bit of time for it to get to them, 21 minutes before the administration of the first drug, but what they found is that, again, survival improved. Return to spontaneous circulation improved. But in terms of good neurologic outcome, it was much, much less in the patients who received epinephrine. And when you compared all comers in terms of survival, in terms of modified Rankin score, the ones who were less than three, there was not a real statistical significant difference between the ones who had what we would deem as good neurologic outcome. But those ones who did have bad neurologic outcome tended to be in the group that had received epinephrine, had modified Rankin scores of three, four, and five, which is debilitating for patients' families to have to deal with that long-term care, certainly a strain on the healthcare system, nursing homes, vent-dependent units, trait-dependent units. And so my feeling is, is that maybe it's not the best thing for these patients. All right. I will give you that the Paramedic 2 trial was a really, really good trial. And it's a trial that we've been waiting for for quite some time. And I got no problems with it. It was well done. It's almost a perfect study. But here's the thing. If I can get the person to the hospital and they have a worse neurologic outcome, that patient doesn't necessarily have to get a trach and peg and go to a nursing home because I also work upstairs in the ICU and I talk with families every day and I tell it like it is. I sit down with them, I, co I coach them every single day and say, listen, we're not going in a good direction here. This is the life that you can expect with your loved one. So we should probably withdraw care now. And many times they agree and we let the person die with dignity. So it's not, uh, it's not a sentence to being in a nursing home for the rest of their lives, but if I can get them to the hospital, at least they have a chance. And the other thing, and this is probably a whole debate in itself, is that if I can keep people alive and they have worse neurologic outcomes, those patients can potentially be donors for other patients who have life-ending diseases, and you can change thousands and millions of lives by having organ donors. And some of these people are people who want to donate their organs after they die. So I feel like you're giving not just that patient, their family a chance, but you're giving the, the whole United States and, and perhaps beyond more of a chance for survival. Interesting. Never really thought about it that way. Thinking about that, you know, I guess we can agree to kind of differently agree. 
Oh, you can agree differently. Agree differently. I like that. We should, we should drink on that. We should drink some more. Okay, George. <laughs> we'll agree differently. Differently agree. Whoa. Tastes good going down. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Guys, nice heated debate. I love it. Um, there were no plastic posteriors, but you know, you can't get that in every talk. Before we go to lunch, we have time for maybe one or two questions. Uh, so we had a, uh, is, is uh, Hicks, Hicks, you're still here? Uh, we had a question on live stream, actually. If someone can grab a mic for Hicks well, that we missed. Hey, Swami, actually, what stream. we're going to do, hello, the voice from above. Yeah, what we're actually going to do on a lot of, the, a lot of these, because there's a little lag when we get those. And so the trauma's way back. Um, uh, so if we've got time, Chris can answer it. Otherwise, if we run out of time, when they put the questions in on email, they will get a, a specific response from one of our panelists. Absolutely. But since we have a couple of minutes, if we've and got nobody a couple really minutes, wants to do hear it. from either George or Haney. Oh, oh, oh. Salim, please. All right, then I'm going to leave that one. Don't worry, none of you guys need to know it was asked. It's fine. So my question is, we have all these kind of animal studies and antiquated studies that tell us we should be giving epinephrine one milligram every three to five minutes. How do we know that that's the best dosing strategy of epinephrine in cardiac arrest and that maybe we shouldn't be doing things like hemodynamic guided epinephrine drips instead where we can individualize it to our patients? Are we sure that this is the best dosing strategy if it, we even decide that it's something we want to use? The answer to that question is we have no idea. Yeah. However, however, and I'll talk about this a little bit in my talk, but this is the movement that we need to move in. We need to decide that 1,000 micrograms, because that's really what it is, 1,000 micrograms is a nuclear bomb to the heart and the brain. And now we need to say, this is too much. Let's start dialing it down and seeing where the optimal dose is and seeing whether that person in front of you even needs epinephrine at all. Yep, I agree. 100%. We, we know that epinephrine causes a lot of beta activity. That beta adrenergic activity certainly can and has been shown to decrease perfusion to the brain. It's what probably leads to decreased neurologic outcome. So we need to find the right dose. And I do believe that dose is a little bit lower. Remember, ACLS was not meant for us in resuscitation. It was meant for people, providers who don't do this on a regular basis. So they have to make it so that it's easier to use in an algorithmic fashion. But we are not using the right dose. Got a question over here? Got it. Got it. No, I'm fine. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. Um, so when I first started, we were giving enough epi to a patient to give a tree a pulse in the field. <laughs> I love that answer. <laughs> and I've seen the decrease in amounts, and I've seen all the changes. But if we're suggesting to remove epi from CPR on the field, are we also considering removing the reversible causes and treatments for those and just going compression? I don't think either one of us are saying that we need to remove epinephrine from the algorithm. We're saying that we need to find the right dosage. We see in the algorithm and in all of these studies that there is increased survival and there is increased return of spontaneous circulation. So in terms of that aspect of it, we are probably doing a good job with epinephrine. The question is, are we doing too much? Are we too much on the other side? Is there too much medication being given to where we're actually decreasing perfusion to the brain and causing these bad neurologic outcomes? So we're not saying get rid of epi. Don't throw epi out with bathwater. We're saying maybe we should find a different dosing pattern. Very similar to the way atropine went away. <laughs> atropine went away. <laughs> so maybe we need to lower the dose of epinephrine, maybe 0.5, maybe 0.75. We don't know. Until we figure that out, we're kind of stuck. What I'd say is that we look at cardiac arrest as one big bucket of disease, like you're cardiac arrest or not cardiac arrest. Well, we know we don't treat VFib the same as we treat PA or systole. But what I'm going to suggest is that the PA subtype, now in the age of ultrasound, where we're starting to look at people earlier and finding these reversible causes earlier, that there are so many subtypes and phenotypes that if we can focus on finding why that person arrested and not just call them a cardiac arrest, then we can tailor the therapy exactly to what's going on. I see you love that. I love it that you loved it. <laughs> I have a question for you guys too, and then we got one more in the back and then we'll go to break. If I decide not to give epinephrine in my arrest, what, what, I mean, am I safe in doing that? Because ACLS says to do it, if I decide I'm not doing it based on paramedic two or whatever else, 
isn't that gonna look really bad for me and how I run that cardiac arrest? I think you have the data now to say, you know, if you wanted to say, I'm just not gonna do it, you have this data and, sub and previous data that says you're safe to hide behind it. I don't know how you're gonna sleep at night, but that's a different story. <laughs> But I think you have enough evidence now to say, I don't believe in it, I don't want to give it, and here are the papers that show why. Chris has a question as well. Besides that, um, when you're in electrical storm in a refractory field, mm. do you think it's, we we're in a position now where after uh, three doses or five doses of the cure threshold, it's reasonable to stop giving it? Because yes. I haven't cut FDA out of my practice, but when I'm smelling refractory VF, which is for me, anyone who's on more than one shot, Just, just to repeat, if you guys didn't hear it, what, uh, what Chris asked is, if you have a patient in refractory VF or refractory VT, you've given a couple of doses of epi, is it smart to keep giving that epi and keep sticking with that algorithm, or are those patients where we should be abandoning that? Uh, is that not a good paraphrase? Yeah. Okay. So it, it's interesting that you bring that up because there's a lot of people who talk in resuscitation about the phases of cardiac arrest. In the very beginning, it's more of the vascular phase and more towards the end, it's more of a metabolic phase. And is that metabolic phase actually used, is epinephrine useful in that, in that stage? And most probably not, it probably isn't. When you're starting to get past that seven, eight, nine, 10 minute frame, epinephrine probably has no use because they're more in that metabolic phase. And I actually do agree with you in that I think epinephrine probably is more likely to lead to that electrical storm and certainly doesn't help you get out of it, which is why we're using medications like beta blockers, which will decrease that catecholamine response to the epinephrine. So I actually do agree that there is a certain time limit where epinephrine is useful, and after that, it really has no use and probably is more harmful than good. Okay, one more question. We're gonna so real quick, um, what are your thoughts on some of the more progressive uh, outlying departments are grow and it's certainly growing that we're moving more towards, you know, for VTAC, VFib, we're starting an epi infusion on a low dose, moving up, and then on PA and asystole, that's when we would get the bolus, one gram bolus, followed up by that infusion instead of just going with that the traditional one gram or uh, one milligram uh, every three to five minutes. What are your thoughts on departments and that more progressive thinking in, in line with that? I, I still think that the one milligram might be too much for the person because in my practice, they're getting an ultrasound when they hit the door. And if I see somebody whose pump is moving, one milligram, a thousand, I'll just say it out loud, a thousand micrograms is way more epinephrine than we give for people who have severe cardiogenic shock. We usually give them 30, 40 mics maybe, and that, then that seems insane. So to give them a thousand mics is just out of control. So I think it's better, but I, and even in those programs that are more progressive, I still think we're putting people in big buckets, and we're not subtyping them and categorizing them as they should be. So with that, we're gonna end our morning. We're gonna go to lunch. For the live stream guys, we're gonna go to lunch as well. Hopefully you guys are having a nice lunch at home. We will be starting back promptly at one o'clock with the second resuscitation block. We'll have another panel, and then we've got some OBGYN stuff in the afternoon. See you guys all back in an hour. You move like that.